The BTR-50 was the first tracked and amphibious Soviet-built armored personnel carrier. It was developed from the desperate need of a more mobile APC, capable of keeping up with tanks in rough terrain, and which would be able to operate in the difficult terrain of Eastern and Central Europe. Despite not having any weapons and being vulnerable to enemy fire, it served for a long period of time within the Soviet and later Russian armed forces, but also in many other countries. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article, I'm your host Stan. You may or may not have noticed, but we have started doing shorter versions of the videos compared to the articles we are publishing on the website, and this is because we were kinda going overboard with the length of the videos and they were not getting good responses. Uh, we will be doing slightly shorter versions on YouTube, but you will be able to find the full version with all the doodads and all of the juicy information on our website. It will be published at the same time as the YouTube video, if not a bit earlier. Check out our website and we'll see you there. In 1948, the GABTU, that is the main directorate of armored forces, requested the development of two types of armored fighting vehicles, an amphibious light tank and an amphibious armored personnel carrier. The two were to share as many components as possible, be able to be converted into many versions, and have versatile hulls for development of future AFV designs. These vehicles were to have the ability to cross bodies of calm water with no prior preparation. Another requirement specific to the APC was that it had to be able to carry 2,000 kilograms of equipment on water. Development had begun through a collaboration between the Solmovo Factory No. 112, the Chelyabinsk Factory, and the VNII 100 Research Institute of the Kirov plant in Leningrad, modern day St. Petersburg. The project manager was the famous Yosef Kotin a renowned AFV designer, having worked on tanks from the KV and IS series of heavy tanks. The Sarmovo No. 112 plant was tasked with the design of the first prototypes in 1948. By 1949 these were ready and were documented as the Object 101, also known as the R-39 light tank, and Object 102, also known as the R-40 APC. They, however, failed the factory tests. A second round of testing was done at the VNII 100 Institute in Leningrad, but they failed those as well. The poor performances led to the Sormovo No. 112 factory being removed from the program. After this disappointment, some of the heads of the No. 112 factory, alongside certain engineers, were removed from their offices and held accountable. What that meant in the Stalin era, you can imagine for yourselves. The Council of Ministers of the USSR decided on 15th August 1949 that the VNII 100 Research Institute in Leningrad should restart the development of the two vehicles, with testing to be started in 1950. Work started immediately on the new combat vehicles and the blueprints were ready by the 1st of September. The project was moved entirely to the Chelyabinsk factory, receiving the GABTU designation Object 750 for the APC and Object 740 for the light tank. In Chelyabinsk, there were four different systems proposed for the steering and propelling of the light tank in water. These were propellers in water tunnels, conventionally mounted propellers on hinges, water jets and tracked propulsion. Nikolai Shashmurin, the famous Soviet tank designer behind the IS-7 and others, who was also involved in the project, wanted to implement water jets. Shashmurin went to the Minister of Medium Machine Building, Vyacheslav Malyshev, to get his idea materialized. Malyashev agreed, and this meant that all alternative propulsion system projects were terminated, focusing entirely on a vehicle with two water jet engines. The first Object 750 prototype was completed in April of 1950. During June and July 1950, factory testing of the first Object 750 prototype began. Allegedly, it flawlessly passed the tests, one of which was to drive for 1,500 kilometers. 
Another trial was testing the buoyancy of the vehicle with the specified 2000 kg payload. Shortly after, two more Object 750s were built and, in August 1950, presented to state officials. State trials of these two prototypes were undertaken between 4th and 29th September in Brovary, in Kiev. However, the prototypes failed the mileage testing and, according to the Council of Ministers of the USSR, on 31st December 1950, VNII 100 and Chelyabinsk were required to fix the issues by 1st of May 1951. The new prototypes were delivered in July and state trials began in August of 1951. They passed the trials and three more vehicles were ordered and delivered by August 1952. Testing was carried out between September and October of 1952. One of the tests was firing the 57mm ZIS-2 and 85mm D-44 field guns mounted on top of the future BTR while afloat. On 30th of January 1954, after decisions made by the Council of Ministers of the USSR, the BTR was put in service and an additional 10 new vehicles were ordered under the name BTR-750P. The Volgograd tractor plant, former Stalingrad, was selected for their production. By 1955, the name was changed to BTR-50P and mass production was in full swing. It would be unveiled to the public for the first time in November of 1957. The BTR-50's lower hull was identical to that of the PT-76, a wide and spacious body for good stability and buoyancy in water, and a heavily sloped front to give better fording capabilities. A large, lightly armored box was mounted over the front of the vehicle. The driver sat in the middle and the commander was on the left, with three TNP-B periscopes to look out from. The driver had a small hatch right in front of him which could be opened in non-combat environments, however it could not be used for entering or exiting the vehicle. On the other hand, he did have an emergency exit port on the floor of the vehicle, which was not recommended to be used while in water for obvious reasons. The compartment where the 12 troops sat on benches running across the width of the APC was open-topped and had no side hatches. This meant that the soldiers had to climb over the sides of the vehicle and sit in open air. This issue was fixed in later versions. The main engine was a V6, which was actually a six-cylinder in line, it was just called the V6. Four-stroke water-cooled diesel capable of delivering 240 horsepower at 1,800 RPM, giving the 14.5-ton APC a top speed of 44 km per hour on roads, a power-to-weight ratio of 16.6 horsepower per ton, and a range of 400 km from three 400-liter tanks. The engine cooling system had a preheater to start in extremely low temperatures, which is a good idea if you're in Russia. The manual shaft type transmission had five gears, similar to the T3485 system. The side clutch helped the driver for turning, assisted by a mechanical transmission and a bad brake. Taking the harsh Russian weather conditions into consideration, the vehicle could operate in a range between minus 40 to plus 40 degrees Celsius. The armor of the vehicle was very thin and was designed to only protect from shrapnel. It was made out of cold, rolled, homogeneous steel sheets welded together. In the front, the armor was 13mm thick, 10mm on the sides and just 7mm in the rear. For later versions, a 10mm thick roof was added. Propulsion in water was done through two main jets with openings in the floor of the APC. Water could be pumped up and propelled out the back of the vehicle through two holes, creating thrust. To steer either one of the holes was shut. For example, to turn to the right, the right hole was closed while the left was still running. Closing the ports to the jets forced the water to exit under pressure through the ports on the side, going forwards, and this also helped with turning. When reversing, both rear jet holes were shut, redirecting water to the two smaller ports on the side of the vehicle, and thus giving backwards propulsion. This system was designed by Nikolai Konovalov and was identical to that on the PT-76.
The BTR50P was the first production version to be accepted into service in 1952. It was very rudimentary with no roof over the crew compartment. The crew and soldiers had to climb over the sides to enter and exit. Likewise, it had no firing ports for the soldiers inside, but considering the vehicle was designed to drive the troops to battle from where they got off by foot, it was deemed as acceptable. Inside the troop compartment, 12 soldiers could sit on the free benches. Because it had no roof, it completely lacked nuclear, biological and chemical protection, which was a large problem considering the military and political environment of the 1950s and 1960s, which was seriously considering the use of tactical nuclear bombs. During the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, the Soviet army experienced considerable BTR-50 losses. The lack of a roof meant that Molotov cocktails and grenades could be dropped into the crew compartment. Thus, an armored roof with two large hatches for exit and entrance for the troops and a round hatch for the commander were added. Considering this additional weight, a torsion bar was added to prevent injuries when closing the door. The roof also allowed for NBC protection for the crew. When the engine was on, air was distributed into the compartment by a supercharger. When the engine was turned off, a ventilator was used. The troops sat behind the crew's compartment that ran along the entire width of the vehicle. There was no separator of any sort in between the two spaces, so communication between the crew and troops was simple. Now that the roof was closed, two gun ports were added on each side wall through which the troops could fire. Other changes were made, such as the addition of a TVN2B night vision device for the driver, a P113 radio and an automatic carbon dioxide fire protection system. A new fuel tank was installed, extending the range to 150 km. The BTR-50PK entered service on 27th October 1958 and was the largest upgrade for the BTR-50 during its service life within the USSR. Many BTR-50Ps would be converted to the PK standard. The BTR-50PU was the most produced and exported version of the BTR-50. In addition to being a conventional troop transporter, the PU version was a command version. These had new radios, an auxiliary power supply, a new cupola in the front with three additional TNPB periscopes, four antennas and lacked weapons. A TVN2B night vision device was also added for the driver. A third crew member was added responsible for navigation. He sat to the right of the driver. Given the versatility, huge production and reliability of the BTR-50, many versions were produced within the USSR, including the UR-67, MTP-1, Object 209 Penguin, ZTPU-4 and ZTPU-2, and Object 211. Due to the large export numbers, BTR-50s have seen plenty of combat in recent history. However, being an unarmed APC, there are not many notable combat stories and scenarios as opposed to battle tanks. Used as early as the Vietnam War, they also saw action in the Middle East. Both Egypt and Syria used them during the Six-Day War in 1967, leading to a handful being captured by Israel. The Syrian armored units consisted of 31 main battle tanks, 2 BTR-50s or BTR-60s and 10 trucks. They were also used in the War of Attrition by both sides. BTR-50s were used again by all sides during the Yom Kippur War. BTR-50s have also been used in the Hungarian Revolution of 1954, the Prague Spring of 1968, the Iran-Iraq War, and as recently as the War in Donbass. Likewise, they have been used in the war in Syria by various factions with many homemade adaptations. The lack of armor and the Soviet doctrinal design of the BTR-50 makes it a poor IFV slash tank in the way that it has been used by rebels and fighters in Syria. Israel first captured around 240 BTR-50s and OT-62s from Egypt in the Six-Day War in 1967. 
The IDF used them extensively until the 1980s when they were sold off or retired in favor of M113 which were first delivered in 1971. BTR-50s were also used by the IDF in the 10 hour war, also known as Operation Raviv. Operation Raviv was an Israeli armored raid into the western bank of the Gulf of Suez on 9th September 1969. Under cover of darkness, 6055s and three BTR-50s painted in Egyptian colors landed south of Ain Sokhna just after 3.30 in the night north of their main objective, an Egyptian radar installation located at Abu Dareg. Without stopping, the armored raiding party drove approximately 45 kilometers south along the coast, raiding Egyptian outposts and attacking the thoroughly surprised Egyptian forces along the way. Infantry forces consisting of elements of the 7th Armored Brigade's reconnaissance company and Arab-speaking Special Forces members fought while mounted in order to maintain momentum and prevent a protracted battle with Egyptian forces. After 9 hours of operating in Egyptian territory, the armored force was withdrawn just after 1200 hours via ship north of Zafarana, having suffered only light casualties and no known vehicle losses. By 1965, the People's Army of Vietnam had also received 50 PT-76 light tanks and 50 BTR-50 APCs from the Soviet Union. While the PT-76 was used successfully in the south, the BTR-50 was deemed obsolete and vulnerable at close range and to airborne attacks. One thing remains certain, even the North Vietnamese found the lack of firepower of the APC a drawback, limiting its effectiveness and versatility. It is important to note that the Vietnamese landscape is not what the BTR-50 was designed for, being rather the opposite of the plains of Eastern and Central Europe. Nonetheless, at least three BTR-50s were converted into self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, with two ZPU 14.5mm AA heavy machine guns mounted. These belonged to the 202nd Motorized Infantry Regiment and were renamed BTR-50 Phong Kong, meaning anti-air. They saw combat in Quang 3 in 1973 and 1975. Starting in 2014, Vietnamese BTR-50s were upgraded using the Belarusian Minotaur upgrade package. The BTR-50 was then slowly replaced by the BMP-1 as a frontline mechanized brigade APC. The BMP-1 was also able to engage enemy targets as it was an infantry fighting vehicle. Radio and command BTR-50s and BTR-50PUs were replaced by MTLBU after their introduction in the 1970s. The MTLBU was a much more versatile and spacious vehicle, better suited for equipping a variety of systems. While most BTR-50s have been retired from active service by 2003, the Russian armed forces still possess large stocks of these vehicles. Potential upgrade plans were met with mixed feelings, some considering them as certified death traps due to the poor armor, while others saw the upgrade potential of such a vehicle similar to the M113's long list of upgrades. The BTR BT3F is a modern Russian amphibious APC based on the BMP 3F IFV. While it uses modern technology, including a remote-controlled weapon station equipped with a 7.62mm machine gun, the BT-3F is, at heart, a BTR-50. Intended to replace the MTLBs and Naval Infantry's BTR-82As, the BT-3F is able to carry troops and provide moderate support during amphibious maneuvers. Unlike the BTR-50, it has adequate protection, Stanag Level 4, and a rear entry and exit door for the infantry. The BTR-50 served as a formidable starting point for future Soviet IFV and APC designs. Thanks to its low price, reliability, versatility, and high production, it still serves in a lot of countries to this day, embedding itself as one of the most influential and well-known APCs in armored fighting vehicle history. Although later BTRs were wheeled to higher speeds and reduced maintenance costs, the BTR-50 chassis still served as a basis for other tracked transporters, like the MTLB. 
Due to its high production numbers and exports, it has seen service in many conflicts around the world from as early as the Hungarian Revolution to the Iran-Iraq War or Operation Desert Storm. Although their combat value was very limited in these scenarios, as the war they were intended to fight never took place, ingenious adaptations and armaments made it work. Like many other Soviet vehicles, many countries have produced their own versions, such as the Polish Czechoslovak OT-62 or the Chinese Type 77. Even today, private companies offer upgrade packages for the BTR-50, as there are still countries that use them. The BTR-50's story has ended in Russia, being replaced by more capable transporters, and is nearing an end globally as the nations that still use them seek to replace them. Nonetheless, the almost 70-year-long service of the BTR-50 is surely something to be impressed by.